Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for the cross of Christ. Lord Jesus, we, we lack words to express our gratitude for what you have done for us, willingly laying down your life for our sins, taking the punishment that we deserve. And for all of us who are in Christ, for those of us who have been born again, for those of us who belong to you, Lord, we know that you are not an add-on to our life, but you are to be our life. And Lord, we will boast in nothing but you and your cross and what you have done for us. I pray that you would <laughs> convict us any time that we think, Lord, that we have uh, accomplished something to be made right with God in our own strength. You've done everything for us. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today who has yet to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ or if they are uncertain of where they stand, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. And Lord, I pray that as we look at your word, that you would help us to, to really lock in to these two truths today. And then we would leave here changed. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, it's good to see you this um, wonderful, cool morning today. Um, that, that was a joke because it's... <laughs> Please see my son after church and pray over him. Um, we had graduation, uh, a graduation service uh, a couple of weeks, uh, a week ago, I believe it was. But not everybody was here. I'm going to embarrass you, Seth. Come on up here. Bridget, Michael, I'm going to embarrass you too. I want you to come on up here. Ah, the whole family. Okay, so we want to, <laughs> we want to say we are proud of you. And do you want to just tell folks what you plan on doing? And I know what you plan on doing. but um, Right now I'm going to like Toyota factory and uh, trying to get into there, taking their program. He's been really excited about that. <laughs> We are proud of you, and I wanted to pray over you. You and your family have had a lot of transitions here the past few weeks, and I just want to pray over them. Would you please join me in praying for the Trent family? Father, we thank you for Seth, and we thank you, Father, for the plans and purposes that you have for him. And Lord, as he studies and as he prepares, we ask and pray, Lord, that you would give him that ability to retain everything and that you would just help him to rest in you, the discipline that is needed to continue studying. And we want to thank you by faith, Lord, for what you're going to do in and through him. And Father, as Bridget and Michael just continue to, to process all of life transitions, I pray, Lord, that you would give them grace and peace. And I pray your presence is manifested in a very real way in their household. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. Thank you. Okay, we are in the last part of our sermon series, building a deliberately biblical church. Now, when we talk about this idea of becoming a deliberately biblical church, it would make sense that we start where? The Bible, right here. We can't be a biblical church unless we say, yes, we must go to the scriptures and that's where we start. Uh, everything must be founded upon and come from the Word of God. Our theology matters. Doctrine matters. And some people, some people will say, well, no, no, doctrine divides. No, actually, doctrine clarifies. It unites. And doctrine also prevents us from drifting into heretical thoughts, beliefs, and so on and so forth. So our theology profoundly matters. Theology gives us the right understanding of God, of salvation, the Christian life, of who we are, of all of life. But there, there is this thing that can happen, and that is this, is that, is, is that when, when, when God's people suddenly start to reduce his word to a list of rules and facts about God, neglecting the actual relationship with God and with one another, and churches can do this as well. People in churches can fall into what we might call a, a form of cold, dead orthodoxy, where we know the right things, we can say the right things, but what is lacking is that actual relationship with God and with one another. 
Today we're going to look at two essential truths. And it is often the neglect of these two truths, a failure to value and pursue them, that will lead to things like dead churches, church conflicts, uh, Christians saying that, well, I just, I don't know, I just feel, I, I don't have that joy any longer. Conversely, when these two truths are valued, when they are pursued in a church, there is spiritual vitality, there is uncommon unity, and in our lives individually, we're able to experience a peace and a joy that this world could never offer. And these truths start with us individually. Personally, we must focus on these two issues and, and, and understand how important they are. Because when we don't, we all suffer. These two truths directly impact the vitality of your relationship with Jesus Christ and with others. So a quick review in case you've missed the entirety of this series and also a quick review to reinforce some things that we have looked at in this series before we get to these two truths. One, Jesus is the head of a church. By now we should know that, right? He is the one who builds the church. Ultimately, he will not fail. But two... He has also given us as his children this remarkable privilege of building with him. But we're to do so wisely, his word says, and we're to use precious materials. Those things that come from the word of God are fueled by the spirit of God, not, not doing things in our own strength, not doing things in our own wisdom. Three, we have seen that to be a deliberately biblical church, we must examine everything in light of scripture. This is the word of God. And so we examine our attitudes, our actions, and what we're doing in light of the Word of God. For we have seen that there are four essential qualities to being a biblical church. The four Ps, so to speak. The preaching of the Word of God. Prayer, referring to corporate prayer. Cannot underestimate or how important that is. Corporate prayer is vital. Three... Personal disciple-making relationships. All of us are to be on mission, making disciples, being about the business of the kingdom. That's an all of us thing. It's not just a church program thing. Yes, the church is to be about that collectively, but individually, that is for all of us. And fourth, we saw last week that we are to be a people who persevere and are patient. That was difficult, right? Because we don't want to persevere in our culture. We don't want to be patient. We expect everything to be like that, right? But nothing worthwhile, particularly when we're talking about sowing and watering and investing in the kingdom of God, comes like that. It often requires great patience and perseverance. Today, we're going to look at two essential truths, and here they are. One, if we are to be a deliberately biblical church, we must pursue being a people who are empowered by and filled with the Holy Spirit. Empowered by and filled with the Holy Spirit. And two, if we are to be a biblical church, we must Love well. Now, if you're a note taker, heads up. I said this too late last night. I should have said it earlier. I gave the poor tech people more slides than they've ever had. There's a lot of texts you're going to see, okay? I want you to write these down, and I want you to look them up and to meditate on them and to study and see for yourself whether or not what I'm telling you is true. That's very important. But I want you to see just how important these truths are. So first, let's talk about being a people who are filled with and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Now, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, there are some things that we need to be clear on. Because there are a lot of, of heresies that get started with a wrong viewing of the Godhead. There's also a lot of misunderstanding about person and work of the Holy Spirit. 
First, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead. Christianity does not have three gods. We have one God and three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And when it comes to the Holy Spirit, sadly, many evangelicals, for fear of falling into excesses or errors that we see in other circles, say, you know what? Uh, let's just not talk about him too much. And that's tragic. That's tragic. And yes, we must acknowledge there are some really bizarre and heretical things that go on in the name of the Holy Spirit. But you don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Instead, you say, wait, instead of those things, let's see what God's word has to say about the Holy Spirit. Because here's a little bit of a preview. You and I cannot do Christianity apart from being filled continually with the Holy Spirit. So any idea that we can just say, well, we'll talk, about, we'll talk about God the Father and God the Son, and we'll try not to talk too much about the Holy Spirit because somebody might start dancing in the aisles or jumping over pews or handling snakes or some such thing. Let's not go there. Let's focus on what Scripture says, okay? So get ready. You got your pens warmed up? You might want to loosen up your hands a little bit. The word Trinity, some people say, well, you know, you guys are Trinitarian in your, view of, in your view of God. The word Trinity, no, is not found in Scripture. But the idea is throughout Genesis to Revelation. For example, when Jesus speaks in baptism, now we could, there are so many texts that I could have cited, but I would have overwhelmed the tech people, and they probably would have all resigned on the spot by saying, stop it, your sinning is too much. But Matthew 28, 19, we looked at last week. This is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So here you have God the, God the Son speaking of God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. Two, very important, because I've heard, I've heard Christians slip, and I don't know what they don't mean, I think it's just a, a slip. But please understand, the Holy Spirit is not an it. He is not a force, some impersonal force. He is a person who goes about very specific works. And we're going to take a look at some of those works. So here we go. You ready? And I'm going to go quickly. So write them down. And you'll, if you don't have a Bible, you can see them on the screen. He teaches, guides, comforts, and intercedes for us. John 14, 26 Jesus said this, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, please note that Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the helper. We will see that again. Whom the Father will send in my name. So here we have a whole Trinitarian thing again, right? God the Father, God the Son, speaking of God the Spirit. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. The helper is the Holy Spirit again. Please note that. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. That word another... Another helper, when he says another, is very important. It means another of the same kind. Meaning that Jesus is saying another as the same kind as me. The Holy Spirit is God like Jesus is God. As God the Father is God. One God, three persons. He is actively at work, the Holy Spirit is, in the lives of the redeemed people of God. So if you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is actively involved in your life. Let me give you a few examples. Romans 8, 14. For all who were led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know how, what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Unlike an it or an impersonal force, the Holy Spirit is a person who also has emotions, intellect, and a will. Note Ephesians 4.30, and there's many texts that we could look at here. We're talking about if you are a Christian, this person of the Holy Spirit lives within you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Very important, a couple of things here. When you, are a, when you are born again, the Holy Spirit seals you. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ and he will not let you go. 
But what are we not to do? We're not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Please make note of this. All sin grieves the Spirit of God who lives within you. You and I can't grieve an it, can we? Or a force. We can grieve a person. The Holy Spirit is grieved when we let the spiritual trash accumulate. When we justify sin and we hang on to our precious like Gollum. Our sin that we don't want to confess. Our anger, our pride, our unforgiveness, our whatever fill in the blank. We grieve the Spirit of God, and when we grieve the Spirit of God, we hinder and harm our relationship with God. There are many professing Christians who are experiencing a joyless form of Christianity because they haven't taken out the spiritual trash. They're justifying it. And in doing so, there's a grieving of the Holy Spirit. And the Lord says, child... (laughs) Let's take care of this. I want you to have that joy. And you're not going to as long as you're grieving me. The Holy Spirit also gives us spiritual gifts. In speaking of the Holy Spirit giving gifts, Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 12, 11. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So as he wills, he gives spiritual gifts. God's word also attests to the deity of the Holy Spirit. He is spoken of as God. Acts 5, 1 through 4, a very famous incident. I want you to notice, I want you to notice a few things here in this text in verses 1 through 4. This is the infamous story of a man named Ananias and Sapphira. I don't have time to get into all the details, but, but what is plain here is plain. So you'll you'll get the main truth about when it relates to the Holy Spirit. But a man named Ananias with his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said in verse 3, note this, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for your... Now stop. Who is he lying to? The Holy Spirit. And to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to... Whoa, he lied to the Holy Spirit. You've lied to God. Jesus talks more about the work of the Holy Spirit to his disciples in John 16, and we can look in verses 7 through 11. Nevertheless, he said, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. The Holy Spirit, again, is a person with feelings, a will, intellect. He is God. He regenerates us, seals us, saves us, lives within us. And you and I are also to be continually filled with him and to keep in step with him. Very important. You cannot leave this part out. We cannot leave this part out. Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. And literally that Greek is be, continually be being filled. This is to be an ongoing process throughout the day of yielding to the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. Galatians 5.25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. So we're to be filled continually with the Spirit of God, to keep in step with Him. You and I cannot talk about being a biblical church if we're not serious about being filled with the Holy Spirit and keeping in step with the Holy Spirit. Just as as it is possible for an individual to grieve the Spirit of God, it is possible for a church to grieve the Spirit of God. We cannot do Christianity apart from yielding the Holy Spirit and being filled 
with him, keeping in step with him. And it's also vital that we do not trust in our own selves, in our power, our strength, our will, our whatever, our creativity, any of those things. But we are to be absolutely dependent upon the Spirit of God. Zechariah 4, 6. Then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And this is where Christians in churches can can get really off track and get into trouble. We dismiss the person and work of the Holy Spirit. We excuse grieving him. We don't seek to be filled by him. We do things in our own wisdom, our own strength, our own way, exerting in our own will, and we make a mess of things. How many of you would say in your individual life that, you know what, there were times I probably was not in tune with the Holy Spirit. I may have well gotten ahead of him. I may well have grieved him. I may well have stumbled into all kinds of things. And had I just been patient and had I been actually filled with the Spirit of God and waited on God, things would have turned out a little bit better. Anybody here besides me? Amen. So a room full of honest people. That is to be us collectively as well. Another thing related to the Holy Spirit that we need to talk about that is very important, which is another side of this. Do not confuse your emotions for the work of the Holy Spirit. Please hear that. Do not confuse your emotions with whether or not the Holy Spirit is at work or not. You might say, well, what do you mean by that? You can raise your hands and you can jump around. You can work yourself up into a state And you might say, man, the Holy Spirit's working. It might just be that you're really emotional that day. The Holy Spirit, when he moves, he might well produce a mountaintop experience. When he moves, he may well lay you low. He may bring you down and convict. He may bring a peace that you can't even begin to explain. He may bring things to mind that you need to get right. So that to say, be really careful about confusing emotionalism with the work of the Spirit. Because when you do that, if you do that, you'll be around other believers and you're saying, you know, I'm feeling this and they're just, they're not spiritual because they're not doing X, Y, or Z. Maybe they're not jumping around. Maybe they're not raising their hands. Maybe they're not having the warm fuzzies. Maybe they're not doing this, this, so on and so forth. Let's be really honest. I've seen a lot over 35 years in churches, a lot on campuses, a lot in different worship services, a lot in different youth uh, retreats, college retreats, preaching at retreats, at conferences, so all these venues. I'll just say I've seen stuff like this. Boy, people are together right before everything gets ready to get started, and usually the, the, the band plays a big part in this. This is nothing against the worship, not at all. I'm saying this is usually how it works with not just youth, but adults. People are there, they're on their phones, they're talking with each other, they're having whatever, distracted, not being prepared for worship. Some of the holiest moments that I have actually had have been in high church situations where I visited just to sit and be fed. And and the presence of God was just so gloriously there. There was a reverence. So people were just horsing around and all of a sudden the bang is up, boom, boom, boom. That was me playing a guitar. I don't know what that was about. And then people are jumping up and down and their hands are up in the air. And then there's just like, what, 30 minutes of prolonged emotion until everybody's like flat worn out, man. They've aerobicized out. And then they sit and they're like, oh, the Lord is moving, the Lord is moving. And then the guy gets up and preaches, but he never actually uses a Bible verse. He tells a couple of motivational things. Maybe he throws a verse in. And then people leave and they're like, oh, that was awesome. And then five minutes later, they're out there just talking like the world. They're cussing. They're saying things that are inappropriate. So don't confuse emotionalism with the work of the Holy Spirit. Can we agree on that, please? Amen. And if we can get that right, we'll get a lot of things right. It is possible for you to come in here and do all the right things and go out there and just gossip and slander, isn't it? I'm not here. It's never happened here. Thank you, Preston. You're a man. (laughs) You get the joke. The Holy Spirit, when he is at work in our lives, he also produces fruit in our lives that show that we belong to Christ. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. There's that word again, kindness, 
goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. When we are in tune with the Holy Spirit, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he produces these things in us. And when we're not, those things are not present. Instead, there are other things that are present. Paul addresses the seriousness of this in the preceding verses in Galatians 5, 16 through 21. Paul says this, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these two are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you were led by the Spirit, you were not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery. And a lot of people are saying, hey, I don't, that's not me. I don't have any works of flesh. I'm good. But wait, there's more. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, those are the works of the flesh. And then people say, well, let's just, uh, we, we do those things, so let's leave those things out. In the drunkenness, orgies, and things like this, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do, and in the Greek are the ideas that practice such things, so it's a pattern will not inherit the kingdom of God. So if these things, if the works of the flesh are a life pattern, that person is unregenerate. And if the works of the flesh are a pattern in the life of the church, that church has profoundly grieved the spirit of God. Like all relationships, growing in that relationship with the Holy Spirit takes intentionality, time, effort, corporately and individually. So first, we must hold this relationship up as one that we need to treasure and value. That's where it starts. I want to properly relate to the Spirit of God. Holy Spirit, I want to relate to you properly. I want to be filled with you. I want to keep in step with you. I want to yield it. So how do you do that? Well, let me give you a few things, a few practical applications. One, again, it is a daily process something that you do throughout the day, growing in terms of yielding to him. In a way, it's like saying, not my will, but yours. Not my will, but yours. Fill me. I often pray, Holy Spirit, fill me. Cleanse me. Anoint me. Empower me to do that which I could never do in my own strength. I want to be obedient to my king. You flow in and through me. Work in and through me because I know I can't do anything in and of myself. Two, you have to spend time in the word and in prayer. You must. You and I cannot be in tune with the Spirit of God if the Word of God is not dwelling in you. If you're not being transformed by the renewing of your mind as God speaks to you through His Word, and if you're not listening to the Father, and if you're not in prayer, you're not going to experience the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you're too busy to do these things, you're busier than you're supposed to be. Three, it requires a recognition and an admission that in your own strength, you can do nothing. You cannot glorify God in your own strength. You must abide in Christ and be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. Doing Christianity apart from continually cultivating in that relationship with the Holy Spirit is going to lead you to a place of burnout, cynicism. You'll lack peace. You'll crash and burn. Spirit of God must be actively at work in you and in us as a church. And in us as a church, that means we must be rooted in the word of God and be a people who are continually seeking the God, uh, our God, rather. And this is where most churches get in trouble, not praying together, not coming together and saying, Lord, what do you desire? Holy Spirit, order our steps, help us to walk by faith. So you get a group of folks to start coming together with my wants, my desires, my, th my thoughts, and they just create a big mess. 
be a church that's deliberately biblical, the church is going to come together and say, Lord, what is it that you want? And to have the maturity enough to wait on him. It's hard, isn't it? Because God, does he operate on your time frame? Nope. He's not working on mine, that's for sure. You hear that? Okay. I thought it was just me hearing it really loudly. So if in case, sorry, okay. Um, so we're going to transition to the second point, but I, I pray that it's clear by now. And the second point is shorter, but it's kind of a boom. It's God's word. <laughs> um, if we're going to be a biblical church, we must remember and value the supremacy of love. You cannot be to the Christian life, and we cannot be a biblical church apart from biblical love. We are to love others as God has loved us. How much did God love you? He loved you so much he gave his one and only son to redeem you. And guess what? Here, get your pen out again. Jesus expects us to love one another. The song we used to sing when I was a kid, it's a really good song. I loved it. I'm not going to sing it for you. You can look it up yourself. John 13, 35. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So how will everybody know that we are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ by our love for one another? So it's not the cross necklace. You can wear one. It's not your Christian t-shirt. Wear one. It's not the bumper sticker. It's the love that we're to have for one another. And when the world sees that, they go, man, that, there's no explanation. There's something supernatural about that. These people got to belong to Jesus. Oh, that the world would know us by our love for one another. So what does that love look like and what does it do? I'm glad that you asked. And why is love supreme? I'm really glad you asked that as well. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through following. Some people only think this is some kind of a wedding passage, which is used in weddings, and that's fine. This was actually written to Christians, to the church. So what does God want the church to know? 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through following. We'll get, we'll get there. Paul is writing, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver my body up to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So it's very powerful. If I claim to have this spiritual gift of tongues, for example, but I don't have love, I'm just an obnoxious, noisy person. If I have powers to prophesy and to proclaim the word of God and say, thus saith the Lord, but I don't have love, I am nothing. <laughs> if I have a deep understanding of the things of God, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all that I have to the poor, as great as that would be, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. If I am willingly martyred for my faith in Christ, but do not love, I gain nothing. Love is supreme. So what does love look like and what does it do? Love is patient, verse 4, and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. Does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. The only way this is going to happen in our lives is if the Holy Spirit is the one doing that work in us. Because in, your, in our flesh, we're not going to do this ourselves, are we? Nope. We're going to do the exact opposite. And this is very well translated. So let's just run through this quickly. Again, love is patient and kind. It doesn't envy other people. It doesn't boast. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. 
It doesn't demand its own way. Love doesn't walk around saying, my way or the highway. That's not love. It's not irritable or resentful. Well, you can't talk to so-and-so. You say the wrong thing, they go off on you. That's not love. It doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing or sin. Rather, it rejoices with the truth and that which is good. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Meaning love perseveres with others. We live in a disposable society where we throw everything away, including people. For the Christian, we are to persevere together in love. It doesn't give up. Love never ends. Paul goes on to say, as for prophecies, they'll pass away. As for tongues, they'll cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, and I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. Folks, <laughs> that's for individuals and for churches. If you are in Christ and you are growing, it is a process of giving up childish, selfish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. Oh, that we would be known as a, as a church, a community of faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love. This is who we are called to be, and this is what we're called to do. And again, we cannot do this in our own strength. We must surrender to the Lord and ask the Holy Spirit to do this work in our lives. We must pray. We must come together and seek the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, make us beautiful. Make our hearts reflective of your heart. We cannot be a biblical church if we ignore the person and work of the Holy Spirit, and if we're not growing in biblical love for one another. So, let us go to the Lord together. We're going to have a time of invitation and ask him to do this work in our hearts. During this time of invitation, if you are watching us on live stream, if you have questions about the gospel, about where you stand in your relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have questions about baptism, if you want to know what that means, or perhaps you've not yet followed through in believers' baptism, if you want to know how to join with and or connect with our church, please send an email to us at info at stonebridgesa.com. If you were here this morning, if you have questions about any of those things, I'll be standing in the front. We're going to stand and sing in a moment. You can come forward and say, I'd like to join with the church. I want to know more about following Jesus. I need to follow through in baptism. Or perhaps you need to, where you are right now, just pray and say, Lord, please do this beautiful work in my life and in our life. However he leads, let's respond to him as we need to. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you that when you save us, that you give us the incredible gift of yourself. That you give us the Holy Spirit. And Lord, that your spirit as he lives within us, shapes us and changes us and is continually at work in us. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that as your people, that we would be increasingly a people who are in tune with, filled with, and keeping in step with your Holy Spirit. And I pray that we would be a people who love well. We know that love is not just sentimentalism. It's not our emotions. It is a deliberate act of the will. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would help us to love well. I pray that during our invitation, Lord, that if there's anyone here who needs to respond to you, whether it's to place their faith and trust in you, whether it's to follow through in baptism or to join with the church, that today might be that day they nail things down. Lord, be glorified in us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.